praise our Lord for the salvation that belongs to him and him alone. Amen. to do and I'm sure you also know by now that the purpose of this letter from John to these believers that he's writing to which includes all of us now praise God is found in chapter 5 verse 13 I really hope soon if not already you're going to have this memorized if someone ever asks you what the purpose of first John is we'll go right here and you'll know it because every week we've been mentioning it it, he says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You see, John gave us this entire letter. The Holy Spirit, obviously, gave us this entire letter so, so we could be encouraged about our walk with him, about our standing in him, that we may know that we have eternal life, because there's so much in this world that would discourage us, and that would come against us, and before you know it, as we all know, the doubts, and the discouragements, and the feelings get in the way, but God said, no, here's a book, so that you'll know that you have eternal life, and as a part of that, John gives this series of tests that we can take to see if we have eternal life. And one of my favorites is coming today, actually. The test today is, do you love the brethren? We're going to read in verse 14 that we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Very important test, a very wonderful statement that John makes right there. If you were here last week, the test was, do you live righteously? And of course, love really is the foundation of righteousness, isn't it? Didn't Jesus tell us that every commandment, every law comes down? Love your neighbor. And then later we read that everything in the law comes down to one word, love. So really, this test of loving the brethren is very similar to the test last week of living righteously. But John personalizes it a bit more. It makes it a bit easier for us to take this test and to see if we're doing this. So again, do we love the brethren? Unfortunately, as we're going to see today, that while some walk in love, others walk in hate. And so not everyone loves the way they should. And of course, that's how we know the difference between the body of Christ and the world. And so we're going to have a wonderful time here in this passage. And if you could stand now before we begin, as we read 1 John 3, verses 10 through 15. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother is righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. 
And Lord God, as always, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its power. And we just ask you to change us today through its awesome power. To be our teacher now, Holy Spirit. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, if you were here last week, you'll recall that we actually talked a little bit about verse 10. That was the last verse we did, but it was such a good verse, I wanted to do it again this week. Because it really serves as the intro into this passage, just as it was the summary of last week's passage. And so, again, as we read verse 10, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil... Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now, as we talked about very clearly last week, and, and John showed us this very clearly last week, that there are two families on this earth. There's a family of God, and there's a family of Satan. And, you know, some like to say, well, we're all God's children, and certainly God loves everyone and has created us all and provides for us all. And so in some ways, displays fatherly characteristics to everyone. But the Bible in no way says that we're all God's children. The Bible is very clear, just as 1 John is very clear. Some are children of God. Those that come to faith in Christ. Those that are reborn as God's children. While some are children of Satan. And verse 10 right here makes it very clear. Some are God's and some are Satan's. And you know, Jesus himself said there's really no middle ground here. You know, there's, there's none who are half gods and half Satans. Jesus himself said in Matthew 12, verse 30, that you're either with me or you're against me. You're either helping me gather people in or you're helping scatter people away. You're not in the middle. And so there's no such thing as some that are half parent, half there. Some try to live that way. And we, of course, know that they're not children of God, those that would try to live that way. And they're not really in the middle. You're either one camp or the other. There's no neutral ground. And, of course, the difference between these two families ultimately is that word, love. As John writes at the end of verse 10, neither he that loveth not his brother. The real test to see whose family you're in is do you love? And, you know, love really has been the theme of this epistle and will continue to be the theme of this epistle. John has a lot to say about love as we continue on. Now, the great purpose, as we talked about, is to encourage us. We may know that we have eternal life. That's why John writes this epistle. But in that, one of the ways he's mostly doing that is to see if we love and to talk about love. And this is not the first time he's even said this right here about loving the, the brother, loving your brother. If you recall back in chapter 2, beginning of verse 9, he wrote, He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness, even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. So John made it clear, as he said a few times earlier in this epistle. You can say whatever you want. You can say I'm in the light. You can say I know the Lord. You can say Jesus saved me and all this stuff. But it's what you do that really shows who you are. And he said you can say you're in the light, but if you hate your brother you're in darkness. If you love your brother, then you do abide in the light. Praise God. And so going back to verse 10, neither he that loveth not his brother. You know, love is the great divide, really. Do you love or do you not love? Do you love the body of Christ? Do you love the church of Jesus Christ? Or do you not love it? And we're going to have a lot to see about that here today. And before we go any further, we just have to ask ourselves this question, why are we able to love now? Because if love is a mark of a Christian, well, why are we able to love? And the Bible tells us why in Romans chapter 5. Verse 5, it tells us the Holy Spirit, whom God has given all of us as his children, has shed abroad in our hearts his love. So that's why we're able to love. We don't need to manufacture this love on our own. God has given it to us. That's why we do it. Now the problem, sometimes because of our sin, 
because of our selfishness, because of a variety of things, that love doesn't quite flow out of us the way it should, but we have that love. It's been given to us by God, as we saw last week in chapter 3, verse 9. We've been born of God. His seed remains in us. The Holy Spirit remains in us. And so we have that love. That's why we're able to love. That's why the world's not able to love in this way, in a true biblical agape way. And so that's why we love. That's why we see the difference between the lost world and the saved people of God. So it really comes down to love. And now as we begin verse 11, we're going to talk about the believer's love. Again, beginning at verse 12, we're going to talk about the world's hate. Because while this is a great passage about love, it's also a great passage about hate. As we're going to see that many hate, and, and we're going to see why they do. But beginning with the believer's love. And John writes, For this is the message that he heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. That we should love one another. John says it's not a new message. And you know, he said that back in chapter 2 also. He said, brethren, I'm not writing a new commandment to you. I'm not making this up. I'm not the first one to think of this. He said, no, this is from the very beginning. And you know, if you read this Bible, you'll see the great theme of this Bible really is love, if you get right down to it. Again, the love of God, the love that he's shown us, the love that we're now able to show him and others. Really, love is what everything ultimately comes down to. True love, agape love. And so John says, from the very beginning, this was the message. Now, you might say, well, didn't Jesus say a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another? And what was that all about? Well, he did say that. But what he was doing was giving us a fresh understanding of that commandment, a fresh emphasis on that commandment. You see, prior to that, we recall the Jews and the, the legalistic aspects of Judaism, which was most of it, quite honestly, at the time, the Pharisees and Sadducees and all of that. They had everything down to laws and laws, and they added their own laws and made up more laws and this and that. And love kind of got lost in the shuffle somewhere along the way. And Jesus really was coming to restore what was already greatest, which is love. And he says, you know, this is new to you all, in a sense, because you've totally lost the way. But it was not the first time that had been given. Even in the Old Testament, we see the command to love. And again, all the commands come down to that one word, love. And so John says, this is not a new message. This is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And now I think it'd be right at this time to ask ourselves, well, what is love? What does it really mean to love? We know that if we ask that question to a few different people, we might get a few different answers. If you ask that question to some Hollywood producer somewhere in some movie, you'll probably get a, a few different answers from them too and different portrayals of what they think love is. But let's ask that question of God. Let's ask that question of the Bible. What is love? love. And I'm sure you're all quite familiar with this wonderful chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where the Bible actually defines for us what love is. You know, I love the Bible for so many reasons and one thing I love about it is it's so straightforward. It doesn't leave us guessing most of the time and, and sometimes things that we wonder with and grapple with God defines for us. What is love? Well, God defines it for us. How can I know I have eternal life? God tells us in 1 John. All these questions we have, things the world wonders about, the Bible tells us what these answers are. Praise God. And 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 4, we read this. Charity, which of course is love, suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Wonder what love is, well, the Bible tells us 
what love is. And I think it's pretty clear from that definition there that love is a lot of things, but one thing it's not is a feeling. And that's kind of ironic because that's probably the one thing that most of the world associates with love, feelings. Mm -hmm. And certainly feelings and emotion come into love and that's a part of this human life and this human experience and feelings can be wonderful things. Wonderful things to have, a horrible thing to let, you know, be run by, of course. But that's probably the thing that people most associate with love, feelings. Do I feel in love? Do I feel happy today? Do I feel like loving you or serving you today? And you read that in 1 Corinthians 13, you don't really see anything that has anything to do with feeling. Love is a choice. You know, we need to choose love. I was reading Psalm 18 yesterday, just because, not to prepare for this, and the very first verse caught my eye. David in Psalm 18, verse 1, a tremendous psalm, by the way, he says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. That caught my attention, that he said, I will love thee. You see, love really is an act of the will. Because sometimes you don't feel like love. When David wrote Psalm 18, he was in, in the midst of difficulties, of course, and, and he was always in the midst of difficulties, it seemed like. And he probably didn't necessarily feel like loving God at that time, or all the time, but he said, I will love thee, O God. You know, love is an act of the will. You know, I thank God for that, because if it was always a feeling, I'm sure my wife wouldn't always feel like loving me. I'm sure some of my family and friends wouldn't always feel like loving me. I certainly wouldn't always feel like loving them either, can't lie. You know, but, but love is not a feeling. I had no one in mind when I said that either. But love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. You see, we do things all the time. That if love was a feeling, we'd be falling in and out of love with each other all the time. Yeah. Yes. In marriage, as friends, in family yes. relationships, we'd be falling in love, out of love, in love, out of love. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Love is a choice. Love is an act of the will. And so John says here, you know, this is the message. That you love one another. Not that you always feel like doing it, but you just do it. That you love one another. You and I, as God's children, should possess the will to love God. The will to love each other. Again, we're not always going to feel like it, but we should possess the will to do it. And when we fail at this, praise God, we have His grace. We immediately go to His cross. But we should possess this will to love each other. We should ask God to help this love to flow out more. Again, as we, like David says, I will love thee, Lord, or I will love you, my brother or my sister. That needs to be our mentality. And so John, again, this is the message that you've heard all throughout the Bible. This is the message that you love one another. And so believers are to love. Well, unfortunately, not everyone shares this love. And I don't need to tell you that. Just look around this world. Not everyone shares this love. Your own experience tells you not everyone shares this love. And of course the Bible tells us that not everyone shares this love. We're going to read about the world's hate now. And it's a very true thing, unfortunately, that the world oftentimes hates the body of Christ. Hates righteousness. Hates God, even, the Bible says. And so let's see what John writes now, beginning at verse 12. He says, not as Cain. We all recall Cain, right? Cain and Abel, back in Genesis chapter 4. That's what John's referring to right here. He says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, of Satan. Again, a child of Satan, as John's been writing about. And slew his brother. And why did he do this? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. In talking about the world's hate, the first thing that John does is he uses this example that the whole world's familiar with. Half the time you watch a TV show and there's a reference to Cain and Abel. The whole world is 
is aware of the story of Cain and Abel. They may not know how true it is like we do, but they're aware of it. And so he uses this example that everyone knows of Cain and Abel. And he says, you know, you're to love, and here's an example of one who did not love, and it's Cain. And not that he just did not love, but he hated so much that his hate drove him to murder. Cain really serves here as a type of the child of Satan, as we saw back in verse 10, whereas Abel serves as a type of the child of God. And they're at enmity with each other in this world. That's what Jesus told us. That's what we see right here. So Cain slew his brother. And why? Because he was evil. His works were evil and his brother's righteous. No need to explore that a little more. What was so righteous about Abel? What was so evil about Cain? You see, I'm sure John is not saying that Abel was just this perfect man who never sinned and was therefore righteous and Cain was not this evil person who all he did was sin every moment of the day. I'm sure that John is not thinking that at all because if that's what he was thinking, we're all wicked. None of us are righteous. So what made Abel so righteous? What made Cain so wicked? Well, when you get down to it, the biggest difference between them, and it's still to this day the biggest difference between the children of God and the children of Satan, is that Abel believed God and came to God on God's terms. Cain did not trust God. He tried to go to God on his own terms. I want to read a few verses right now to help explain this. First of all, Hebrews chapter 11. I'm sure you're familiar with Hebrews 11, the great hall of faith, all these great men and women of faith and the things they did. Well, you know, Abel is in that hall of faith. In chapter 11, verse 4, we read this, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Notice that, where the Bible tells us that Abel's offering, which we'll read about here in a moment, was in faith. Well, what is faith? Faith really is nothing more than knowing what God has said and believing it to be true and then living it. When you get down to it, faith is simply taking God at his word. So for Abel's offering to have been in faith, God must have instructed them on how to come to me. What kind of offering you needed to bring to me. And Abel believed God. And Abel brought that offering. Cain did not. And now for more on this, let's go right back to the beginning. <clears throat> we'll start in Genesis chapter 3, though, because there's some important things we need to understand. And then we'll go to Genesis 4 and the story of Cain and Abel. But again, we're told that Abel's sacrifice was in faith. By faith he brought his offering. Well, you all know Genesis chapter 3, I'm sure, and we actually spent about a month going through it a few months back, a wonderful, wonderful chapter about the fall of man and the unfortunate sin that that brought to all of us. Well, right after the fall of man, right after Adam and Eve both sin, Genesis 3, verse 7, we read this, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, of course, they were physically naked. They were created that way. They were perfect. They needed no covering. They were not ashamed to be naked. There was nothing that would harm them because the world was perfect. But now here comes sin. We know we're naked. So let's make some clothes for ourselves. That's what they do. And yet, you go down to verse 10, and God is in the garden now. And they are afraid of God because their relationship with God has now been severed. And we read this, Adam speaking to God. He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Well, verse 7 just told us they were no longer naked physically. They had clothes on. What's Adam talking about? Obviously, this is much more than a physical nakedness. This is a spiritual nakedness. One that we all possess in the sight of God. Our sin has left us naked before God. 
And when you're naked before God, you want to run and hide in shame, just like Adam and Eve. And so they acknowledge, we're naked before you, God. And then, you know, a bunch of things happen. And a great verse in Genesis 3, verse 21, we read this. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Again, they'd already had clothes they'd made out of figs and leaves and stuff. But they were still naked. Again, this is a spiritual nakedness. Well, now we're told that God made coats of skins and clothed them. Well, where do coats of skins come from? Animals. What did God do? He made a blood sacrifice to clothe them. Why did Jesus come to this earth? To make the final blood sacrifice to clothe us with his righteousness. Something we all need. Why did God kill this animal here? To clothe Adam and Eve, to cover them at least temporarily until Jesus would come with his righteousness, to cover their sin. So God obviously had made it very clear, both in his demonstration to Adam and Eve, as well as a command I'm sure he gave, though the Bible does not say it. We can know this from Hebrews 11. It was in faith that Abel offered his sacrifice. God made it very clear, the way to me is through blood sacrifice. The only way to get right with me, to cover your nakedness, to cover your shame, is through blood sacrifice. So they knew this. They knew this. Well, let's see what happens now in Genesis chapter 4. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain. And said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. So again, why? Does God not like fruit? No, you know, there's actually sacrifices you can make in the law that involve fruit and grain and different things. It's not that God doesn't like that stuff. It's that Cain refused to come to God in God's turn. God had made it clear both in what he did for Adam and Eve and in a commandment that we're sure he gave based on Hebrews 11 that the way to me is through blood sacrifice. Just like he's made it clear to us today, the way to him is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Some choose to believe that. Abel chose to believe that. Abel showed faith in God and came to God on God's terms. Some choose to not believe that. And try to come to God on their own terms. And that's where works-based salvations come in. That's where cults come in. That's where all sorts of evil and heretical things come in. People trying to come to God on their terms. Really what you have here with Cain and with Adam and Eve before him, when they tried to clothe themselves their way, is nothing more than the beginning of false religion. People trying to come to God on their terms. Like every false religion in the world today tries to come to God on their own terms, not on his divinely ordained terms. And so you go back to John, 1 John, and he says, you know, why did Cain murder Abel? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. They had both done evil things. Abel acknowledged that. Abel came to God on his terms. Cain did not. So Cain, therefore, just continued in his evil. Cain, in his pride, just like man today in his pride, refused to come to God on God's terms. And if you continue to read back in Genesis 4, we read that, And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And then, of course, a few verses later, he murders his brother Abel. So John gives us this example of Cain. Again, one that serves as an example really of the entire unsaved world. In their pride, they refuse to come to Christ on his terms. Instead, try to go to God on their own terms, 
realizing it does not work, which everyone in their heart of hearts knows, and therefore anger and jealousy and all sorts of other evils come from that, and hatred ultimately towards those who do come to God on his terms. Cain murdered Abel because Abel believed God and came to God on his terms. And for whatever reason, Cain could not humble himself enough to do the same thing. You know, the world today continues in many ways to hate believers because they refuse to humble themselves and come to God on his terms. Praise God that we are redeemed. We have done that. We do follow and trust God, but the world does not. And so as a result, the world is often going to hate believers. Again, because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Because their works are evil and ours are righteous in God's sight, they often will hate us. They often will be jealous of us. The Bible says to expect this. And John says to expect this now in verse 13. He says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. You know, just as Cain hated Abel, don't marvel. He says, if the world hate you. You know, the real marvel would be if the world loved you. Because the world is of their father, Satan. As verse 10 says, therefore they are aligned with Satan against Christ. And against his church. And there's a lot of reasons they may hate us. They may hate us for the conviction that we bring to them of their sin. They may hate us for the truth of Jesus Christ that we stand for. Again, they may be jealous of what we have, the peace that we have, the joy that we have, and that they lack. There's a lot of reasons they may hate us. All we know, though, is that they will. Again, John says, marvel not if the world hate you. You know, John says something very similar in his gospel, quoting the words of Jesus in John chapter 15, beginning at verse 18. Again, the words of our Lord. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Again, Jesus told us, don't be surprised if this happens. He says they're going to hate you. Why? Because they hated me. And if they hated me as the master, they're certainly going to hate you as the servants. Same thing John says here. No doubtedly he was thinking about the words of his Lord and his Savior as he wrote these things, as God led him to write these things. He had, of course, experienced this in his own life in many occasions. And so he now says to all of us, don't marvel if the world hate you. Again, the same truth that Jesus uttered in that Gospel of John. Don't marvel if the world hate you. You know, it would be a pretty bad thing for us if we were popular where Jesus was unpopular. You know, if we went to a place where the people there did not love Jesus, hated truth, hated his church, and but, but they accept us and they love us and we're popular in that place, that is not a very good sign for us. If we are popular in places where our Lord is unpopular, that's not very good. Jesus said, they're going to hate you because they hated me. John says, marvel not, brethren, if the world hates you. We need to expect this hatred. Now, do we encourage this hatred? <laughs> no. We, we love. We're to love them. We're to live righteously. We're to serve them. You know, Peter writes something really interesting in his first epistle in chapter 4. I just want to read it now. Because we need to make sure that if the world hates us, it's for Christ, not because of us. We don't give them reasons to hate us except for our walk with Christ. And Peter says this here in 
1 Peter 4, beginning at verse 14. He says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So Peter says, you know, you're actually happy if the world hates you because of Christ. They speak evil of him. They don't like him. And so they're going to speak evil of you also. So this is a happy thing. But then he says in verse 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. You've got to like that. Sometimes we get involved in places we shouldn't. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. And so you like that. That's what I like Peter that. says. It's very clear the only reason the world should hate us is because of our allegiance to Christ. As Christians, we should be the very best citizens, the very best workers, the very best students, the very best people this world has. And you know, if we're living as Christ tells us to live, we are the very best people this world has by the grace of God. And so nothing about the way we live should make the world hate us. They should love us for that. What will make them hate us is our stance for Christ, our commitment to truth, our allegiance to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if that is what is making people hate you, if that is what makes you unpopular then that's a good thing. But if it's your own sin, if it's your own evil, the way you treat people, the way you talk about people, if that's what makes people not like you, that's not good. And so Peter does a good job by, by helping clarify that for us. And so again, the world needs to love us for the way we act. They'll hate us for who our Lord is. But that's okay. You know, praise God. So marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you, and then verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. So the world hates believers, and yet we as Christians, we as believers, love other believers. And that verse right there, that is the great test today. You know, all these tests that John gives us so that we may know that we have eternal life. The great test today is that verse right there. Again, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. And you know, I thank God for that verse. That verse has encouraged me so much over the years. Because sometimes I look at my life and I'm certainly not where I want to be in a lot of ways, and I see all the sin and all the struggles and all the this and that, things that should not be there. And yet I see that verse and I cling to that verse because I know that I do genuinely love the body of Christ. I don't love perfectly. I'm sure you all could attest to that. But I know that I have that will to love the body of Christ. I enjoy being with the body of Christ. I find great joy in that. And so that verse has encouraged me so much over these last few years. We may know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. And so I, I apply it to myself and I, I say, you know what? The reason why John wrote this epistle, it's coming true for me. He wrote this to encourage us that we may know we have eternal life. But when I read that, it encourages me that I know that I have eternal life. I've taken that test and I pass it. I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I just know that I love the brethren. With all the flaws and faults I have, I can say I know that. That's a great thing to know. Therefore, I can know that I have eternal life. And hopefully you can too. Hopefully you can read that verse and say, you know what, I know that also. With all my flaws and all my faults, I know I love other Christians. I know I love the body of Christ. I enjoy being with the body of Christ. Praise God. If that's you, then be encouraged today. You know, be encouraged today. Great verse in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, we read, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. You know, we're called to love each other more. Yes, we're called to love the world. 
and enough to share truth, be witnesses, take the gospel to them. We're called to do that, but we're called to love the body of Christ even more. That's why Galatians says, you know, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. You know, do good to everyone, but especially brothers and sisters in the Lord. Love everyone, but especially love the body of Christ. And so you go back to 1 John, and you know, praise God. We know, you got to love that word, we know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. You know, sometimes you've heard it said, I'm sure, that if you have one true friend in this life, you're very lucky. And you know what? Maybe for the world that's true, but that's complete nonsense for a child of God. Because if you're a true child of God, you have thousands and millions of true friends around this world. Hmm. You know, you have a kinship with the body of Christ. The same spirit that's in them is in you. And you may have never met them before, but the moment you do, and you find out they're a child of God and you're a child of God, it's just such a wonderful thing. You know, I remember a few years ago, my parents went to visit my grandparents. Who at the time, we were living in New Mexico. And they met another Christian couple out there. And they, I think, had dinner with them and, and different things. And they came back and they said it was so encouraging to know that, you know, the body of Christ is everywhere. And it was as if they had knew, known these people for years. And they just met them. Well, why? Because the body of Christ, the Spirit of God, the same in them that is in you. There's a love for the brethren that exists in the body of Christ. You know, and I thank God, but I'm sure you all have your own experience of meeting someone and you just feel that kinship and you have that will to love them because they're Christian and you're a Christian. You know, praise God for that. So you can be very, very blessed in this life to know that you have a whole lot of friends. And so thank God for that. We know that we've passed from death unto life. That's important, too. We can't skip over that. We all start this world in death. We really are the walking dead in this world until Jesus Christ comes up to us. Ephesians 2 tells us that we're dead in our sin. You know, we're born dead. But we've passed from death unto life because of Jesus Christ. And Romans 6 tells us all about this, too. You know, we've been buried with Christ, and so now we rise again to newness of life with Christ. Praise God, we've passed from death unto life. And loving the brethren is not what makes us do that, but it encourages us that we have done that. We've passed from death unto life. And so, as I said, I love that verse. That's definitely, without a doubt, one of my favorite verses, and I really mean that. We pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. Who knows the end of that verse? He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. You know, the unsaved world is also the unloving world, and we're told they abide in death. And that's quite, quite different, isn't it, from believers who abide in Christ. You know, we've talked about that here in First John also. That was... Another one of those tests of salvation. Do you abide in Christ? Do you remain in Christ? Are you continuing forward in Christ? That's what we do. And Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. So we abide in life, but they abide in death. They have not yet passed from death unto life as we have. Of course, we pray that they would. And pray they would soon. But as of now, if they hate their brother, if they hate the body of Christ as Cain did, they're still in death. Again, they're very clearly still abiding in death. And then verse 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. I feel like I've heard that somewhere before. And John had too. The Sermon on the Mount, he was present for that. When Jesus really turned everyone on their heads. When he said, you know, the law says not to murder. But really, what it really means if you get down to it is don't even hate your brother. Because that is murder. And the law says not to commit adultery, but... You really get down to what God 
means don't even look at a woman lustfully. Because that is adultery. And Jesus goes on to say, Be ye holy as I am holy. Setting the bar way too high for any of us to attain to it. Proving that we needed him. We need Christ. And so here, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That would be all of us. We've all hated at times. We don't live lives of hate, but even to this day, I'm sure if the situation is just right and something happens at just the right time in the right way, we might have a, a feeling of hate come over us. We might have a moment or two of hate come over us. Does that mean we're now murderers and we don't have eternal life anymore? <coughs> have we lost our salvation? No murderer has eternal life. Praise God for His grace. It is true that no murderer has eternal life. The Bible cannot lie. That is absolutely true. But through the cross of Jesus Christ, we're no longer murderers. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, we're now righteous. And He loves us and we love Him. And He's forgiven that sin and all the other sins. And we thank God for that. And even those that have literally committed murder can come to Christ. We think about that thief on that cross. He was a lot more than just a thief. He was most likely a murderer, a real rebellious, evil man. And what did he do? He turned to Christ at the very last moment of his life. And Jesus said, today you're with me in paradise. Why? He was a murderer. Yeah, but Jesus died for him. That sin was now forgiven. Same thing with us today. We're murderers too. We've all hated and we will continue to hate at times, unfortunately, by the grace of God. Hopefully not, but it may still happen. But be, because of Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. We're now righteous in Him. But the world does not know Christ yet. The world abides in death still. The world still is in this hate. They hate God. They hate the church. They hate each other half the time. You know, so consumed by themselves, consumed by their pride, just following Satan right to hell, and they don't have eternal life. You know, as we begin to close, a thought that occurred to me, we've been talking about love and how to love the brethren. That is the great test. Do you love the brethren? And of course, within that, the world will often hate us, as we've seen and sometimes they hate us enough to even murder us. You know, there's been a lot of martyrs in this world. Abel was not the only one who was killed for his faith in Christ. Many, many people have, and unfortunately, many, many people continue to be and continue to be persecuted and suffer, and maybe that's going to happen to us one day. We don't know. Only God knows. But even with all that said, as much as the world hates us, we're called to still love the world. You know, Jesus told us we're to love our enemy. You know, and we think about that. We don't want to love our enemies. We don't want to love those that hate us. We don't want to love those that may even want to kill us, get rid of us, if they had the chance. And that's what our Lord did. Again, Romans 5, we're, we read that while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. You and I were no prize either until Jesus Christ died for us, until he saved us. We were enemies of God also. And there's a whole world out there that are enemies of his, and Jesus is actually calling us to go to that world. You know, there's a, another passage in John, John 17. This is the great prayer that Jesus prays right before he dies, the night before his death. We read in verse 14, I have given them thy word. Jesus is talking about us as his disciples. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So Jesus says the world hates us because we're not of the world. But then verse 15, I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from the evil. That's very important. Notice, Jesus does not pray that we would avoid the world at all costs. 
He does not pray that we would be immediately taken out when we get saved. He prays that we would be in the world, but kept from the evil. You see, he sends us to the world. In Matthew 10, 16, Jesus tells his disciples, Behold, I send you forth as a sheep in the midst of wolves. That's not a pretty picture. Sheep in the midst of wolves. What happens to sheep in the midst of wolves? Usually it doesn't end well for the sheep. Well, Jesus says, that's how I'm sending you out. That's how he continues to send us out. And so, yes, the world hates us, but we're called to love the world enough to speak truth to them. The very thing that makes them hate us, we're to bring to them the truth. The truth, the truth of Jesus Christ. The truth of their sin, yet his grace. Their evil and his goodness. How they're on their way to hell, but through Christ they could have eternal life. We're called to bring that truth. And again, the moment we start to feel like it's just too hard, it's too discouraging, the world hates me too much, we have no further to look than our Lord Jesus Christ. If there was anyone who could have said, it's getting too hard, it's getting too discouraging, the world just hates me too much, it was him. And yet we're told that he loved his own which were in this world, and he loved them to the very end. That for him was the cross. You know, we're called to love. <coughs> Even the world. Yes, the great test is do we love each other? But if we love each other, then we also love the world because God's love is in us. Now, would it be wise to have your best friends come from the unsaved world? Certainly not. The Bible tells us this in various places. Those that you're closest to should be the body of Christ. Those that have the same spirit that you have. But we are called to love the world. We are called to love them enough to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. We're called to love the brethren first and foremost, but we're also called to love them. And so, that's 1 John 3, verses 10 through 15. You know, all about love and hate unfortunately. Some love, some hate. Those that are Christ's love, they love his children first of all, and then they also love the world. And hopefully we continue to let God flow that love out of us by seeking him, by abiding in him. You know, next week, Lord willing, we're going to talk about how we are to love. You know, this week was primarily that we are to love. But next week we'll see, well, how... <coughs> are we to love? And just as a little teaser, John's going to write in verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Again, anyone can say I love you, but do you really love? It's not what you say, it's who you are. John's made that very clear throughout. So we're going to see, again, love is a choice. Love is action. We're going to see that next week. We're to love. We're to love each other. We're to love the world. We're not always going to feel like it. But like David said, I will love thee, O Lord. We have the will to love today. I will love thee, O Lord. I will love thee, my brother. I'll even love you, my enemy. And I'll bring the truth to you by the grace of God. That needs to be us today. That's a tall order. Again, it's impossible, if not for the fact that God had already given us that love. But now to let that love flow out, it's going to require grace, and then more grace, and then more grace. And so right now, let's just pray. Sing with me the grace is our God.